our worship. Well, Exodus chapter 20. Now, we've, we've expanded it a little bit, for sure. And uh, remember that Israel is still standing there, or as it were, at Mount Sinai. And they're, they're receiving the Ten Commandments. And uh, we said the Ten Commandments is a, is, is a unconditional or conditional covenant here. A Mosaic covenant. A conditional covenant with Israel. God has made this with Israel. And, and this basically is setting down the, the order of worship, the duty that Israel has towards God. So we can think of the first half of the Ten Commandments is Israel's duty and privilege in worshiping and uh, following God. And then the second half of the Ten Commandments is, is uh, Israel's duty to one another. But when I look at the, the uh, first half of the tablet, and, and matter our duty to God and Israel's duty to God, I think I come up, I, I come up with the word worship. Worship. Because we're to love Him and serve Him and adore Him, okay? And, 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 and the word worship brings to mind everything that we are to do. Now, the how of our worship here is in verse 2 and 3. Well, actually, we, we'll be looking through um, at verses 4 through 6. But you see, before you can worship somebody, you have to know who that person is, right? And so in verse uh, 1, we say, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. See, this is the who of our worship. And that uh, sets up the next verses where it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation, and them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. So verses 4 through 6 is, is the how of our worship. Now, we've gone through, uh, in the last two or three weeks, this breaking this down in the sense that we're not to, for example, make idols, we're not to bow down to them, we're not to serve them. Um, and we've, you know, discussed some things about the Roman Catholic Church and areas that they touch upon and why they use idols and imagery and pictures and, and this idea of intermediaries or co-redeemers or co-mediators, okay? And we've showed, I hope, by the scriptures that such things is basically idolatry. It is still idolatry. Now, as we think about our day today, as we come to the last uh, parts of these verses, you see, there's two, two things that really motivate people in a matter of worship and idolatry and worshiping false gods. The one word is called superstition. See, Paul stood before, uh, the Apostle Paul stood before Mars Hill, and he said to these ones of Athens, he says, he says, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. superstitious. And this is really the mindset of, of really all of us, okay? Uh, you know, well, <coughs> well we're, we're not made, uh, God is not alive, God is dead, we're, we're evolution, Darwinism, all this, and that over there, no, 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 but you know, in, deep down in our hearts we know that there is a God, but see, the problem is that uh, natural revelation is not going to get us to God. It's going to get us to making idols or gods of ourselves or worshiping ourselves. And so the first word there is superstition. Super, superstition. The second idea is this. In this matter of idolatry, is strange, uh, we call it strange fire. Strange fire. Well, that's back in Leviticus, okay? This Moses' his two sons. They were next for the, to be the high priest, and they're serving as priests there in the, in the tabernacle. What happened? They, they, either they, they said some believe they were either drunk, or they uh, mixed the, the incense wrong. And so when they came into the tabernacle, what happened? The fire of God came out and destroyed them. And the Lord says, you're not going to present strange fire on my altar. That means God says, I, I'm going to be worshipped a certain way. It's not just, you know, whatever I think, okay? No, no, this uh, strange fire. See, there is no express command to worship God with images or idols or crucifixes or pictures or drama 
or movies. There, there is no express command in the, in the Word of God. The, the express command is this. The Lord said to Israel, you saw no similitude. You saw no image. You heard a voice. You see, and we say the Word of God is sufficient. What God has revealed is sufficient. And also, since the Word of God is sufficient, Christ, the Lord Jesus, is sufficient to save you. So you don't have to add anything to Him. You don't have to subtract anything from Him. You don't have to add ritualism and ceremonialism and, and all this other stuff that not only the Roman Catholic Church adds and the Eastern Orthodox, and you, we can go on the list, down the list, okay? But I'm saying there's, there's no express command for all these strange files. Or we could go to some of the Pentecostal circles. The wildfire that's going on, okay? Turn, if you would, to uh, Habakkuk 2.18. 2.18 and 12, through 20. I just want you to, in, in a matter of summary, Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 18. And this is really the summary, okay? And then we'll go on here. About those that, that worship idols or use idols to enhance their worship. Their, you know, we went through all this and I'm not going to mention it again. But you know why uh, Roman Catholics use idols and imageries and all this. Uh, enhance their worship. And secondly, they're asking the saints their, uh, to pray for them. Okay, we went through this. But look what the Word of God says about this. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 18. What profited the graven image that the maker thereof hath given what profit? The mold and image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusted, trusted therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake to the dumb stone. Arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst. But the Lord is in his holy temple, that all the earth keep silent before him. And what we can say, as we've studied on the how of worship, we've looked at idols and imageries and drama and all these things that, that supposedly enhances our worship, the ritualism, the ceremonialism, all that stuff, okay? We can say this morning, what profit is there in those that worship these things? And dear ones, there is no profit at all. There is no profit at all. But you see... There's actually a plunging of oneself into utter darkness and depravity. Okay? There's a reason why the idols are called vanity. There's a reason why they call, they're called dumb idols. We read in Isaiah, you know, it says, those that make idols, okay, become like them, right? They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, they hear not. They, you know, all these things. And so it, it's, there's no profit at all in using idols, images, uh, um, all these things the Catholic Church uses, or, it's, or Eastern Orthodox, and whatever it is, there's no profit. It only brings you into further darkness, okay? Further depravity. Because it is an express, it, it is violating God's word, okay? Now, we're going to look at verses in Exodus 20, 20 verses 5 through 12. And six, and in the last message actually on how of our worship, the how of our worship. Because if you look at this in these verses, we kind of kind of have to wrap it up. But there's a couple questions here, as we see here. What does God think about idolatry? What does God think about idolatry? The other question: Why does He react so to to idolatry? So let's look at first of all, what, what does God think about idolatry and idols used to present him or idols used in the worship of God? Look at chapter 20, verse 5. Okay? He says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, or serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. See what God, what's his evaluation of those that use idols in worship? Whether it's enhancement or whether it's intermediaries, God says, you basically hate me. You hate me. That's God's evaluation. You mean I, if I use idols to represent God and idols to help enhance the worship? You see, God says, I hate him. Compared to verse 6, it says, those that keep his commandments, it says, of them that love me. 
Okay? And so it's, it's a love-hate thing. But God says, if you use idols and you use these imageries, okay, you're, you're basically hating me. Hating me. But see, isn't that true of every sinner? Isn't that, wasn't that true of you before you got saved? Wasn't it true of me before I got saved? Maybe this morning you're not saved. You know what? The Bible says you hate God. You hate God. Let me give you a couple verses here. Romans 1.30. This is, Romans 1.30 talks about the idolatry of the Gentile world. Okay? And part of the list of unrighteousness, okay, because of their ungodliness, because they are idol worshippers, okay, uh, God gave them up. And here is some of the list, okay? Romans 1.30 says, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient, to parents. You see, we are haters of God. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. Not only can we say we hate God, but our whole fallen disposition, our whole nature from birth, is that we are at enmity. What does that mean when you're at enmity? Let me read it to you. Romans 8, verse 7 says, Because a carnal mind, is that the lost man or woman? That's the natural man. That's the, that's the man, woman, boy, and girl, fallen in Adam. Just the carnal, okay? But he says the carnal man is enmity, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it cannot be subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, first of all, it says, for it cannot be subject to the law of God. If you put, put rules and regulations, and we should have that. We should uh, support justice and laws and things like that. But see, the, the laws will never change anybody. You know that? Uh, prison will never rehabil rehabilitate anybody. Only the Lord Jesus. Faith in Him. So we need laws, okay? But notice, like the stack, uh, there, there's opposition in the, in the sinner's heart. They cannot be some... It's a constant battle. That's, that's why we have constant anarchy and rebellion, breaking the laws, Okay? But notice here also in these verses it says, it says, uh, so then they that are in the flesh. That doesn't mean this here. It means fallen nature, our Adamic nature that we receive from Adam. Everyone, we're born sinners by birth and sinners by choice. And so this flesh, this fallen nature, it says it cannot please God. You know what happens to the old man when you become a Christian? It's crucified. It's put to death in Christ. So God doesn't build anything upon the flesh, the old Adamic nature. He puts it to death because there's nothing in the flesh. And it's just not passions and emotions. It's our mind. It's our reasoning. It's our understanding. Okay? Even the 21st century man who could put you know, people to the moon and, 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 and land rovers on Mars. Okay? Their carnal mind is at enmity. They cannot please God. They will not please God. So this idea of... Uh, those that are idolaters hate God is, is, a, is a common thing. Because all of us, by nature, by birth, we hate God. Now, now notice here for a minute. See, God declares in His Word, love me, worship me aright. The sinner or the religious idolater declares, they say, no, no, we're not, I'm not going to do that. I won't do that. And dear ones, this is rebellion. Remember we said last week, in Galatians chapter, I think, 2, you see, talk about those that want to worship, worship angels and intermediaries and all these things. We called it will worship. Because that's all the religious person can come up with. It's self-will. It's, you know, think of all the ritualisms and ceremonies and all the traditions, okay? And, and you come into a church building, and, a, and this is just a building, this is a meeting house, this is a assembly house, this is not the church. But see, if we had stained glass windows, if we had, you know, candles and music and dim lights, and, and what happens during most services? You can go to Anglican or even Presbyterian, a lot of good Presbyterian, okay, to, to preach the Word of God. But you can think of Anglican, you can think of uh, United Church, Catholics, Lutherans. What is their main emphasis? It is the Mass, or it's the Lord's Table. It's the breaking of bread. You see, the preaching of the Word is minimized. But see, what is going on? This, this show, this entertainment, this, uh, this ritualism, this ceremony. And everybody is watching, basically. Watching the priest do something. Watching this, that. But you see, that's, that's not the way it should be, okay? 
You see, the, the religious idolater says, no, 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 we're going to do it my way, our way, our church's way, and we don't care what the Word of God has to say. We will not have this man to rule over us. We won't come to the Word of God. We will keep our tradition. Think of this for a minute. Uh, when the Lord Jesus confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious rulers and stuff of his day, what was it mainly about? It was their traditions. It's how they, what, observed the Sabbath day. You see, they had all these man-made rules and regulations, and they, 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 they obeyed that instead of the Word of God. God says, that's rebellion. God says, that's an indication that you hate me. So, God thinks about, what does God think about idolatry? He says, an idolater is it actually hates me. But what about the next question? Why does God react so? How does God react? Look what it says there in chapter 20, verse 5. It says, first of all, we see that God is jealous. He becomes jealous. We'll see that in a minute. But notice what it says there, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, you know, we're, we're not deists. And what, what do you mean by deists? Well, you see, the deists believe that there are there is a God, but God sits back and does nothing. He doesn't actively, sovereignly intervene or orchestrate into, into the affairs of men. Okay? We can say, well, the world is out of control, all this and all. God is orchestrating, God has a plan, God has a purpose, He has ordained it from the beginning, time of, before eternity, before time, okay, in eternity, and He's bringing His purpose and His good pleasure to pass, and it's going to come exactly in the timing and day, and everything's happening just like God wants. It's never been out of control. You know what, dear ones, it'll never be out of control. But you see, the thing is, you see, God is visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. You see, and, and, and even today, dear ones, listen. We say, well, that's Old Testament. I don't worship a God of wrath. I don't worship a God of judgment. Dear ones, that might be an idol. You see, think of some of the Jesuses that people come up with, okay? Some of the, some of the gospel messages, uh, some of the, the, the Spirit of God is an imitation. It's another Jesus. It's another gospel. It, it's another spirit. You see, if that's true, then it's idolatry. No, no, we have to worship the Jesus of the Bible. We have to worship the God of the Bible. And he says... Uh, he visits the iniquity. He's, he's, he's actively what? Well, first of all, we, we may not want to talk about that. Actively doing well. He's saving sinners, right? That's good. We, we can talk about that, right? He's saving sinners. He, he's being merciful. Uh, if you ate this morning, it's because God gave you some food. If you have health and, and, and life this morning, because God has showed you mercy. Even if you're not a Christian. But see, this other hand, you see, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, don't like the, they don't like the idea that God is visiting His wrath upon sinners. You know that He's doing it right now? It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Romans 1, verse 18, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You see, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed right now upon sinners, upon idolaters. Well, I, well, I thought God loved everybody. The only way you'll know if God loves you is you get into Christ. You believe upon Him. You trust Him. Outside of Christ, there's no guarantee in the sense that, you, that God loves you. You know that? Until you get into Christ, until you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, until you trust Him, it's, it's like uh, a dear brother used to say, he says, until you get into the ark, what's outside the ark? Coming judgment. The clouds of judgment, the clouds of, uh, of the rain, you know, the flood. You see, until you get into the ark, until you trust Christ by faith, you, you, you have no guarantee, you have no claims on God that God loves you or God's going to save you. The only way you'll know is you get to Christ. You make that a priority. And so, dear ones, it says, how does God react to idolatry? How does He go to those that hate Him? He says, His wrath is, is sent down from heaven. Ephesians 5, 6 says this. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You see, sometimes we think, we're like, you know, you hear Christians saying, 
or Christian preachers saying, well, you know, uh, God loves you and you just go on in your sins or you keep on being worldly, keep on being fleshly, you know. Uh, well, no, 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 God won't, does, won't love you in your sins. You know, uh, unless you're being sanctified and you're holy and following after God, unless you're born again this morning, okay, uh, you know, you, you have to be holy. God says, be holy as I am holy. And God gives us grace. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Yeah, everything is for us. Everything He's working in us to be holy. And, you know, it's no, no. Uh, preachers will say, you can live in sin. You can take Jesus as Savior and leave Him alone. He, won't be, he doesn't need to be your Lord. That's a lie. See, He says, notice it again. He says, uh, let no man deceive you with vain words. For, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. God, God wants us to be holy. <clears throat> also, let me read to you 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 16. And, and these verses imply and, and tell us that God is actively, what? Pouring down His wrath upon sinners for their sins. That's why we see the misery, okay? That's why we see the murder. We see all that's going on in our, in our nation, okay? Uh, it, it's, because, it's because sinners have chosen their own sins. They've chosen their own ways. They've chosen to fight God and hate God. And God is not just sitting back and saying, Oh, I wish I could do something about it. First of all, He's able to save you. He could speak a word and He could save you. You know, I, I, just, uh, I despise the attitude is that you have to give God permission to save you. How many of you were saved that way? Anybody here? What well, women? I thought that was the gospel. You know, God voted, the devil voted, and now God's waiting for you to vote. Why do you, you mean you didn't vote first? That's not grace, brother. We know that. That's why we didn't raise our hands. We realized that we didn't give God permission. He broke in on us. He saved us. In spite of our wickedness, our blindness, our rebellion, our hatred, He gave us a new heart, new love for the Lord Jesus as we read the Scripture. Providentially. You see, God is in control. You see, He can save sinners, He can open up hearts, and He also can harden hearts. And He can, he can let the reprobate. He can give people over to, to uh, reprobate minds and things of that sort. But you see, in 1 Thessalonians 2, let me read this and we'll go on this morning. It says... In 1 Thessalonians 2, 15. Who had both killed the Lord Jesus. And Paul the Apostle is speaking about the Jews. Okay? Now this is get us in trouble. Okay? We were on national TV. Saying that the Jews killed the Messiah. We'd have people probably picketing about our door. But you say they did kill the Jews. The Jews did kill the Messiah. Their Messiah. Okay? And, and, the, and the wrath of God is coming upon them. This is what Paul says. Okay, now I, I believe the Lord's going to deal with Israel again. He's, he still has a heart for the Jews. I, I'm not writing off the Jews. I'm not writing off Israel. You understand what the Bible says about that. But see, right now, they're not, um, they, they're not reconciled to God. Okay? Notice it says there, Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Could you imagine that? Speaking, saying, no, no, don't, you know, I mean, here are Jews that know, the, in a sense, they know the power of God. They, they don't want to speak the word, they don't want to let Paul speak the word to the Gentiles that they might be saved. They don't get in. They don't get in. They don't go uh, hear the gospel and believe. They reject it. They persecute others. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins away, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. You see, God's reaction, okay, to those that hate Him, and especially idolaters, and that's the context of what I'm giving you, okay? He says, He visits upon them the iniquity of the Father. He punishes the fathers, and we'll see also He punishes the children. Okay? Now, in Exodus 34, verse 14, it tells us, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous. So the first thing is that God will visit the iniquity upon uh, idolaters because He is a jealous God. A jealous God. We'll look at that in a few minutes here. 
What does it mean that God is jealous? God is a jealous God. God, uh, His name is jealous. And so when, when you, you, you bring in idols or images or pictures, whether they're enhancing your worship or teaching aids, as the Roman Catholics say, you know, they're helping us to, we're not worshiping the saint, we're, we're, we're using them to go to God. And, you know, and I said, God has not delegated any, uh, the Lord Jesus hasn't delegated his, his, his ministration to anybody else, okay? There's only one mediator, you go to the Lord Jesus. But the Roman Catholic Church, for example, will say, no, no, they're going to enhance uh, our worship. There's intermediaries who pray to the Virgin Mary, pray for us sinners. That's idolatry. Simple as that. Okay? But the reason why God hates that and pours out His wrath upon that is because He's a jealous God. And the idea is that God will not tolerate His honor, His glory, being transferred or given to others. He, can, he will not tolerate it. Okay? Uh, Isaiah 42, 8 and Isaiah 48, 11. Let me read them to you. This is what God says through His Word. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 48, 11. It says, for my own sake, even for my own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory unto another? You know, that, that's a principle there, brother. You see, God might, you know, in the matter of Israel, he says, Israel, you've gone off and worshipped idols, the heathen idols, the Baal and Astroth, you've worshipped all these other idols. He says, I brought you into bondage, I punished you, I brought, uh, you know, nation upon nation upon you, and God says, that my name be not polluted. <coughs> See, God has made a covenant with Israel. God has said, I am your Redeemer, I am your God, I am your husband, I cannot tolerate, okay, for my name's sake, God says, I will deliver you. I will spare you, okay. The idea is that God is so jealous for His name and His own honor. He says, I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to tolerate someone putting honor and glory to something else besides Him. Now see, as you think of jealousy, you ought to think of as a, a husband, right? A husband. I think Proverbs and other places speaks about the jealousy of a husband. Okay? God, as, a, as Israel's husband, burns with holy jealousy for his wife. Now think of that. Idolatry. What is idolatry? Think of this for a minute. Now this is, in a, again, a context of Israel and, and God. God is here giving them the Ten Commandments. He's giving the Sinai Covenant and Mosaic God. And He's saying, okay, this is the covenant that I'm making with you. And, and, and I'm going to be your God. And this is how you're going to worship me. And I'm going to be in your midst. And, and uh, this is how you're going to do it. Okay? What is idolatry? <laughs> Idolatry is, is like coming home and finding your wife in bed with another man. That's idolatry, bro. Look what, look what uh, if you look in your bulletin, Thomas Watson, he's an old Puritan. Look at the first one for a minute. You see, you see, this idea of idols enhance my worship. Idols help me. You know, pictures of saints. We don't worship them, but we, you know, this is what the Roman Catholics say. We don't worship them, but they're, you know, they're, they're uh, um, immediate, they're go, you know, we're, we're, we're imitating the saint's life. You see, they live such a holy life, and, and, and they're helping us to worship God, and they're helping us, encourage us to live a Christian life. And that's what they, that's why they, see, they, they're not, they say that they're, they're not worshiping God. They're not making another idol, and they say, this is God. No, no. They're using other things, like Images and pictures that enhance or helps them to worship God. Okay? Now, look what, uh, what Watson says. What profit is the graven image, the mold image, and a teacher of lies? Is an image a, lay book, a layman's book? Then see what lessons this book teaches. It teaches lies. It represents God in a visual shape who is invisible for Papists or the Roman Catholics. Okay? To say they make use of an image to put them in mind of God. Remember that? 
You know, it, you know we're not worshiping the idol. It, it help, you know, we get a picture of Jesus. It helps us to visualize it. it you know, we're, and, and it says, for Papists to say that they make an, an image is to put them in, in mind of God. Okay, helps us to remember these things. Help us like a memorial. Okay, is as if a woman should say she keeps company with another man to put her in mind of her husband. <laughs> that's silly, isn't it? But that's what it is. You see? Could you imagine my wife walking down the street and saying, well, this picture of a man, you know, helps me to, to, to remember my husband. And you say, no way. You, you know, I, I'm stupid, but I'm not that dumb. You know? But see, that's what it is, dear ones. They have these idols and these images, you see. It, it, and he says, it is as if a woman should say she keeps company with another man to put her in mind of her husband. You see, idolatry is like coming home and finding your wife in bed with another man. That's what God is saying to Israel. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm your husband. I'm your redeemer. You should have only eyes for me. And so, uh, this idea of idols and images, all these things, dear ones, God hates. God hates. Because he's a jealous God, first of all, and he's very particular, in a sense, his wife, Israel. Okay? Now think of that for a minute. Isn't the same thing said about the church? The Apostle Paul? Second Corinthians, he says, I want to, he says, Corinthians, I want to present you as a chaste virgin. Paul says, I'm jealous about this. You know, I want to present you as a chaste virgin. Your spouse, church, your spouse to Christ. He's our husband. Yes, we're betrothed and we're, we're not married yet, legally in a sense. The consummation of the marriage is not done yet. But in, in all legal realms, we're married. The church is married to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our husband. We're the bride, dear ones. And how do you think the Lord Jesus feels when we flirt with the world? Flirt with other men, other religions? I think he gets red in the face, don't you think? I think he gets pretty jealous. But oh, is that love so, so amazing, isn't it? That he loves us? Let me go on here for a minute. Let's look at this. Uh, we've got a few minutes here. Go back to Exodus 20. So we've answered a couple questions, okay? What does God think about idolatry and idol worship? All these other uh, sophisticated, deceptive use of icons and all that stuff. He says, those that do this... Basically, they're showing to me that they hate me. And what does, how does God respond? Well, it says He visits the iniquity. He pours out His wrath upon such because He is a jealous God. Extremely jealous. He's, he's jealous for His honor and His glory and even for His namesake. You see, He said, this is my property. This is my wife. He says, since she can't, she won't even keep herself clean or, or, or faithful. But for my name's sake, because my name is on her, I will deliver her. That's the idea. <coughs> Not because she deserves it. Not because she is uh, faithful. But God says, this is mine. I put my name on it. And that's my, my wife. And I'm going to deliver her. Now let's look at this, this aspect of uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Okay, In Exodus 20, verse 5... Notice it says there, visiting the iniquities of the father upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, uh, isn't that a hard verse? Think of that for a minute. What comes to your mind? <coughs> God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation, upon the children. Well, that, that, that's not fair. What did the children do? Is there unrighteousness with God? God? God forbid. But you see, we, we must look at the scriptures before we begin to kind of, you know, we take this verse, you know, I, you know the, the atheists and those that, that love to destroy the Word of God, they, they, they bring up all these examples uh, from the Word of God. Uh, and they, uh, they say, look, look, God is not righteous. God is not just. Look. He, he killed all the babies there in, 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 in Joshua's day. He, he, he wiped out all those inhabitants of the Canaanites. Day. See, God is a baby murderer. And so these, these atheists today stand and say, look, see, that's what the Bible says. How can you follow such a murderous God? 
And I say, who are you to stand in judgment of God? I mean, I just, I get really irritated. I mean, that's, that's one of the, you know, we're going to bring God. And so we come to this verse, and we're saying, wow, God is so unjust. God is, how, how can this be? He's visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. But see, what we have to do is we have to go to what the scriptures say. You see, we need divine revelation. We need insight. We need illumination. We need to hold our tongue. Find out what the Word of God has to say about this. Okay? From first impression, we would say, that doesn't sound fair. But you see, in Lamentations, let me give you a, a, a Lamentation 5-7. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. So there's other places in the Bible that, that speak similar, okay? So I would ask you to move, uh, turn to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. Does God judge the children, the innocent children, for the iniquity of the, of the fathers? He says, like, the children didn't do anything wrong. Why is he judging them? Well, see, that's our impression, or... See, if we know the scriptures, we know better that God doesn't do it that way. God is righteous in everything He does. He's holy in all His works. You see, God is good all the time. No matter if I can't perceive it. Okay? And so I have to come to the Bible and say, no, no, that's not right. God doesn't punish innocent people, does He? No, He doesn't. So then we have to figure out what is God saying here? Okay? Through Moses. So Ezekiel 18... Look at verses 1 through 3. And this is, a, this is a good argument. I mean, this is, if you, if you read along with me, if you would. Ezekiel 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? You're not going to use this proverb anymore. What, what, is, what is the prophet saying? Or what is Israel saying? It's like in John 9. When the disciples come along and, they, and they, the Lord is going to deal with the blind man, he says, who, who, did, who did sin? Did his parents sin? Or did he sin? What do you mean? He's blind because of his parents' sin? Is that how God, that, that's what God judged him that way? And we have to say, no, no. That, that's not what the scripture. But see, this is what they've come to believe. You see, they're, they're sh the, the, the Israelites here are... are uh, you see, it's easy to blame everything on my father, right? Blame everything on my dad. It's his fault. And that's what they were doing. Oh, and our forefathers, they sinned, and because of their sins, we're, we're in this, this mess. Uh, he says, the children's teeth are set on edge. And look what God says here. First of all, run down to verse 14. Verse 14. Again, you can take time to read it all, but I'm just going to jump in a couple places just to show you that what, what, what Moses says is he's not going to, God is not bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon uh, innocent people, okay? He's not unrighteous or unjust there. Okay, he's not acting unjust. We'll see. Notice in verse 14, he says, Now, lo, well, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted his eyes to idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife. And he goes on with this list of things for, for, for a, a good man, a righteous man, a sinner, a father, a son. He goes on, he says, but notice it says there, uh, that seeth all his father's sins, verse 14, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such light. Okay? Uh, Look at verse 18. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Speaking of the father, okay? The father's going to die. Not the son, okay? Look at verse 19. Yet say ye, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful, and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteous of the righteous shall be upon them, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So again, uh, verse 21, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, 
and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So, it's not, it's not as if, if God is visiting the children of the fathers with, the, with their iniquity, uh, thinking, well, God is punishing the father upon the children, and children are being punished because of the, the father's sin. God says, no, no, that's not the way it is. Every man shall stand before God and, and be judged for their own sins, okay? Now, that's, what, that's very important, okay, that we realize that. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says this, The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And then in Jeremiah 31, 29, 30, In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. And so, go back to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 5. So we have to come up with a new idea. We have to come up with the right interpretation. See, God is not unjustly punishing the children for the sins of the fathers. But what happens, okay? There's some things that we have to see here. Now you have to also, when you come to Exodus 20 verse 5, what is the particular sin that the Lord is putting his finger on? It's idolatry. Remember that, idolatry, okay? Now notice, it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, mean, well, it's, it's, uh, it's pertaining to idolatry. God continues to punish the sins of the fathers upon the children. Now wait a minute. Um, Jeremiah 32, 18 says, Thou showest love and kindness of the thousand, and recompense iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of the children after them. You see, he's going to visit, he's going to recompense. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay. And I believe the right interpretation here, the children are punished, okay, because they follow in the footsteps of the father. The children follow in the evil ways of the Father. Okay? Uh, you see, ignorance of God is passed on. But think of this. Ignorance of God is passed on. You see, darkness begets more darkness. You see, an idolatrous father teaches his idolatrous ways and traditions to his children. You see, like in Ezekiel 18, the wicked son who follows, we didn't read that, but the wicked son who follows the sins of his wicked father, he gets judged. But the righteous son who does not follow the wicked ways of his father, he does not get judged. So think of this, okay? No man sins unto himself. There are consequences that do follow. Now think of that for a minute. No one no man, no woman, no father, no mother sins unto themselves. There's always consequences, okay? There, there, let me just give you a couple verses, okay? Uh, Leviticus 26, 39. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity, in, in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Now, again, the idea is not that God is punishing innocent people. It's because Israel, the, the elders, the priests, okay, they followed their wicked ways and they brought judgment upon the nation. And who is suffering? The children. There's always consequences, okay? Let me give you another verse. For example, um, Isaiah 65, 7. It says, Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountain, and blasphemed me upon the hill. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. There's consequences, okay? The consequences of a godless father. Where are they? Maybe some of you think of some. How about a bad example? A bad example. Pretty simple. How about evil communication? You see, we're talking about idolatry. These ones are going to teach 
and, 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 and show their children that, you know, no, worship Baal, uh, worship Jehovah and Baal, worship Roman Catholicism, worship idols, okay? Worship idols of your heart, greed, materialism, covetousness, Worship yourself. See, these, these fathers set bad examples. They communicate evil ways. Also, there's loss of advantage. Loss of advantage. You know, uh, my parents never took me to church. Never took me to church. I don't remember ever, ever, a Bible being open in my house. Never did. No, if you, you know, my mother said, well, you can go to Sunday school, or you can go to uh, a Bible club, or what was like a BBS. I think one, I remember one year going on the BBS bus. You couldn't go down to the church down the street because the teenagers were committing fornication and got back to my mother. She said, you're not going to that church. So the only hope we had of even hearing the Bible as young people was shut down. Okay. But you see, there's consequences to God, of a godless heart. Bad examples, evil communication, loss of advantage, national and family judgments. You see, it's the traditions of the fathers passing on false worship. That's what God is judging here. You see, the fa like father, like son. <laughs> yeah, the, the sons are following in the footsteps of the father. That he was an idolater, they're going to be idolaters. It, it happens that way. There's a special note I want to, before we go on here, real quickly. You see, um, a call bondage, okay? If your grandmother or great-grandmother or grandfather uh, dabbled into occult practices where witches, warlocks, uh, uh, astrology, big time, there are curses, there is occult bondages that pass on from one generation to another generation. You see, messing with your horoscope is, is, oh, that's not much. But there are definitely occult bondages and practices of your ancestors that come down through your line, okay? And, and that, are, that God continues to visit, okay? Occult practices, occult bondages, you see? And, and, that, and that is a, you know, you talk about, you know, you think about curses. There, there are curses on families, okay? That, that, that it continues on from one generation to another generation to another generation. But in this, in this idea of, of visiting the iniquities upon the children, okay, there's one other aspect. We'll just say it real quickly and then we'll go on and sum it up. You see, in Romans chapter 1, verses 23 to 28, that section of Romans 1 is, is an inspired record of the idolatry of the Gentile worlds. And it's really, you can go there, and it's up to date for our day. We see the idolatry. You see, it says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. You see, God, the Apostle Paul first presents the sin of ungodliness. The Gentiles are idolaters. <laughs> Weeks ago, we talked about the mystery of Babylon. We, what happened there back with the creation worship, uh, uh, what, what God gave in creation, you see, it was corrupted, okay? And the Gentiles have been corrupted. Israel is set apart. It says, okay, God says, I'm going to let you. I want you to worship me. I love you. I've made a covenant with you. And this is how I want you to worship. I don't want you to learn about the idols or the gods of the other nations. You are destroy their idols. All this, remember? But see, while Israel has light and revelation, all the Gentile worlds are left to themselves. And that's what's happening today, too. In Romans chapter 1, it says, God gave them over. God gave them up. Why? Because they would not be thankful. They wouldn't worship God as the true and living God. You know, creation speaks of God and shows God's glory in that sense. But see, we're, we're steeped in evolution. We deny God. We're atheists and all that other stuff, okay? But you see, as we embrace that, and if you're embracing this this, this morning, for example, uh, evolution, all these other things, God gives you hope. God gives you over. He gives you over to a reprobate mind where you now, he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, that's idolatry, and unrighteousness of men. You see, you cannot be moral without God. You can't be holy without God. And as 
our nation forgets God and forsakes God, okay, what is happening? God is giving us over. He's giving us over to our own sins. He's removing the restraints of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And we see anarchy, rebellion, and ungodliness in dear ones. Idolatry is rampant in our city. Idolatry is rampant in many homes. Why? Because God is visiting. You see, some people say, well, Tom, you hate homosexuals and sodomites. No, I don't. I don't know. I go out and witness to them. I talk to them. But see, it's not just one sin among many sins. Okay, sodomy is not one sin among many sins. It is a particular sin showing us that God is giving our nation over to a reprobate mind. God is leaving or has left Canada. Think of that. That's visiting the sin. Now, what happens to those little children? And I pray for the little children. My neighbors. I pray for others that go to public schools. And they're being told that homosexuality and same-sex marriage or heterosexualism is all wrong. What are they being taught? About family, about manhood, about womanhood. Well, if I want to go into a woman's bathroom and I think I'm a woman today, then I can go into the woman's bathroom. You see, that's God's judgment, brother. Giving up. Visiting. And those little children are going to grow up hating God. And they're going to think marriage is wrong. They're going to think homosexual is right. They're going to think about this and think that. Why? Because God is judging. Dear ones. Now, See, God does visit the iniquity of the children in the fourth, third and fourth generation. Let me give you an example real quick and I'll be done. You know my family? My family were drunkards. My dad, my biological dad, he died with a beer can in his hand. All of us, brothers, sisters, my one sister, we were drunkards. I mean, we partied. We, we drank heavily. All of us followed in the footsteps of my, of my father. My sister, she was killed by her husband, accidental death. That was 20. They were fighting over a gun because she wanted to go bar hopping in a, in a certain place. My two brothers, both dead, younger brothers, alcohol related. One older brother, Bill, my younger brother, Steve. You see, drunkenness has almost, almost utterly destroyed my family. Okay? The only reason my brothers don't drink anymore is because it's, it's wore, wore them out. They can't handle it anymore. And some still do drink. You see, God does visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth parent. I'm not saying that you know, so we're innocent. No, no. We took up the habits. We took up the example from my father. You see, alcoholism or drunkenness, okay, it, 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 that's an escape. It, it, it's not a disease. It's an escape. I can't Face the pressures. I, you know, I can have a little bit of time out. You know, I, I take a few beers or a drink of this, that. You know, there's all reasons for, for drinking, okay? It's all wrong, okay? But you see, I learned from my father and my parents and my brothers that this, is, this, is, this was the acceptable thing to do. The second thing that, that is in my family is divorce. Every one of my children, every one of my, my, my brothers, have been divorced once or twice. And even, even my brother has married my sister-in-law from another brother. Complete nasty immorality. My father was married three times. My stepdad was married two times. And every one of my brothers have been divorced or remarried to someone who's divorced. So what happened to you, Tom? <coughs> What happened to you, Tom? You see, I, I learned, you know, uh, you know I, I sat 
in the courtroom with my mother, and I, I saw the foolishness of my dad, and, and I saw a divorce, I saw the fighting, all these things. You know, that's how you handle marital, you know, uh, you get a divorce. That's what my parents taught me, by example. But let me close here, and we'll be done with this. Look at verse 6 there. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And keep my commandments. You see, what happened to me is that God showed me mercy. He just showed me mercy. You think, you think about that for a minute. Why have I uh, OD'd on drugs and alcoholism and out the drunkenness? Because God showed me mercy. How can I, this, this morning or so, in a day or two, celebrate my 26th, did I get it right, 26th anniversary? Because God has shown me mercy. I, 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 there's no other reason, brother. There is no other reason. You see, in verse it says, <laughs> verse 6 it says, mercy. And showing mercy unto thousands. I like that. How many generate two? You know, how many children will you have in two or three generations? Seems that like you know, um, I'm great great grandfather. I might see some of my great 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 grandkids. Okay, but in the matter of God's mercy, He says, I give mercy to thousands. This is God's character, God's grace. He's merciful. In Exodus 34 7, it says this. Let me read this to you. Exodus 34, 7. It says, Keeping mercy for thousands. I like that. Not only showing mercy. That's what it says in Exodus chapter 6. Showing mercy. Here it says, Keeping mercy. You see, God reserved that mercy for me. It was purchased in Christ. And one day there in California, God says, Tom, I'm going to show you mercy. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. And then in Exodus, uh, Jeremiah 22, 18. Jeremiah 22, 18, it says this. The same kind of uh, wording, okay? Jeremiah says, Thou showest loving kindness, this loving kindness unto thousands, and recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosoms of their children after them, the great, the mighty God. The Lord of hosts is his name. Notice it says, he shows loving kindness. And with that, you can, you can uh, also come with uh, the truth that God is long-suffering. When he breaks into a godless family and breaks the cycle and brings salvation to total strangers to Christianity, there's only one word for it. Mercy. Mercy. Consider this morning what mercy it is to have God fearing parents this morning. Think of the mercy you have, young person. Maybe, you know, you, your parents are saying, Count your blessings, name them one by one. But, dear young people, I'm not saying that you're not uh, thinking of this, but I want you to, to encourage you to think even more. What a blessing it is to have God-fearing parents. Yeah, they're not perfect. Well, that's true. You know what? Neither are you. But if I can, you know, compare it to my stepdad and to my dad, and you know what the glorious thing is? I believe my, 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 uh, the Lord saved my mother in the latter years. And I had the privilege. My, my stepdad was dying. And I was in New York, and uh, I was going to give my little brother a break. And I said, I'll come down and take over for you for the week. And I got off a week of vacation from work. I went down. And you, you know, my stepdad grew up in church, Presbyterian Baptist. He went to church every day. I mean, his mother took him to church all the time. All the time. When he married my mother with eight kids, there's a man. There's a man. You know, you, you start, you know, wow. I, I, he loved my mother, but he loved me. He loved the children. He, we had eight kids, man, George. 
He said, I'm going to be their father. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to provide for them. Uh, he worked hard. He was, he was a great man. But he never opened up a Bible once to me. And when I witnessed to him after I got saved, he says, you keep your religion to yourself. But see, on the interesting, in the end, he was a, uh, we all got a call saying my, my stepdad was dying. So we all rushed in. He's in intensive care. My brother came from, from Arizona. Everybody's coming in because we think our stepdad's dying. So I got in there. We got there. We're talking to him and stuff like that. And I have the whole, whole, whole list of people praying for my stepdad. And you know what? He didn't die. My brother was a little angry. <laughs> not in that, he, I'm not saying he was, he, he, you know, he spent all that money. You know, when you have a bereaved thing, you know, like on an airplane flight, you, you know your parents are dying. You go to the, to go to the uh, airlines, they don't give you a break. Not one little break. He spent thousands of dollars. Now, I commend him for that. I'm going to say that, okay? He, he didn't spare any. He said, I'm going. I'm going to see my stepdad. Okay? But it was like, doctors, when you, you said he was supposed to die. You know? But he's getting better. He's getting better. He was released. And before he was late, released, I said to him, Pop, it's time for you to start reading the Bible. <laughs> Because I knew the story. My mother told me the story. He was brought to church every week. His parents, his mother was faithful. He grew up in church. He grew up in Bible. Didn't open up once. And so he called me back later and said, Tom, what did you, what did you want me to read? And I said, I, didn't, yeah, I, I promised I would read, you, read the Bible. And I said, well, you didn't really promise, but I'll, be, I'll take it. I'll take it, you know. And I said, start reading John. And so he had this uh, orderly come in, because he's dying from cancer. He had this orderly come in every every couple days, like a home nurse kind of thing, and uh, my stepdad would say, I want you to read the Bible to me. And so I was there that last week when he died. Basically, uh, him, it was just him and I there when he died. And guess what I did for that whole week? I talked to him, I prayed with him, and I read the scriptures to him. I said, Pop, do you want me to stop? He said, no. One night, Saturday night, it was. And uh, I've never had anybody die in, 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 the, you know, in your presence, but he, he died, he passed away. And then the next day or two, people coming in, and uh, they, they, different orderlies were saying how Pop had changed, how Pop was asking for the Lord, how Pop was asking you pray for me. He even, you know, and, and there's, this, there's a ray of hope, George, that maybe, just maybe, God showed my stepdad mercy. He showed his mercy. So consider the mercy that God has given you, having God-fearing parents. They won't lead you into idolatry. They won't bring down the curses of, of the ungodly, but they will bring to you blessings. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. They will pray for you they will instruct you in the Word. They'll live lives that magnify the Lord. See, I never had godly parents. But I do know that the Lord delivered them. What is the word for us this morning? What does God think about idolatry? He says, those that commit idolatry and worship Him in a false way, an unlawful way, no matter if it's like well, they are just enhancing our worship. You know, we, we've read and we've discussed the, the, uh, the deception of the Roman Catholic Church. No, they're, they're just helping us, their visual aids. To, you know, it's deceitful, but it's still idolatry. And God says, idolaters hate me. God says, I will pour out my wrath upon them. I will visit uh, them uh, their, upon their, their heads. He says, I am a jealous God. I'm not going to tolerate any honor, glory given to an idol. He says, I will visit the sins of the iniquities of the Father upon the third and fourth generation. He says, it's not because the children are innocent and God is, and God is unrighteous. No, it's because the children learn the ways of the Father and the Mother. They're idolaters, and we become idolaters. But see, when God shows mercy, He breaks that chain.
He breaks that cycle. Boy, is he glorious. He could just let he could have just left me alone, right? He could have, he, that, that's what I wanted. No, in his mercy. So dear ones, listen. Do you know the Lord Jesus this morning? See, there's a, you see, you have to worship God in spirit and in truth. You have to be born again. You have to have God, Holy Spirit in you before you can worship God aright. And that's not all. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the only way you can get to the Father, and the only worship He will receive if you bring it through the Son. No other way. He won't accept your worship. He won't accept your prayers. He won't accept your praise. He won't accept your money. He won't accept you at all. Ever. There's no other way. You must come through the blood. You must come by faith. You must come to the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. And it has to be in the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit. And don't leave this out. If you leave this out, you can't. You can't. Because as soon as you leave this out, what happens? Let's set up the icons. Let us set up images. Let us set up candles. Let us set up the traditions. Let us set up the ceremonies, the ritualism. We've got all, you know. Let's have a movie about Jesus. That's okay. That's an evangelistic too. No, it isn't. This is. Preaching, teaching the Word of God because you saw no similitude. You saw no image. You saw no idol. You just heard the Word. Remember the day when God gave you ears? Hear the word. That's mercy. That's great. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And what mercy. Oh Lord, what mercy. What grace. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning. And oh, I pray that you would have mercy upon my brothers. That you would go to them and you'd help me to be a better witness, faithful witness. You would open up the Word of God to them. You would bring Christians into their pathways. You would tell them to turn on the radio and there would be a Christian preacher. I just ask for mercy. Father, we think of our children that have departed and turned from you. We know this morning that you, you, you are omnipotent. All power belongs to thee. So it's never, it's never a matter that you're not able. We just ask, Lord, in thy great mercy, and that you would be glorified in an infinite way. You go and rescue our children. Rescue our loved ones, our husbands, our wives, our grandparents, those, my brothers, sisters and brothers. Oh Lord, show mercy. And be glorified in it. Be magnified in it. Exalt the Lord Jesus in it. And we'll praise you, we'll worship you, we'll bless you, we'll magnify you. Because you are worthy. What a, what a gracious God. Thank you for that you can show mercy to thousands mm -hmm. that love you and keep your commandments. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joseph Cutler.